Hi, my name is Christopher Lert, and I'm a data scientist at Bell Canada. Hi, I'm Masoud Hashimi, uh, a senior data scientist at RBC. And today, I'll be talking about applying generative neural networks to fit functional causal models. Well, thank you everyone for coming out this afternoon. Uh, my name is Christopher Lert, and I'm in the data science team over at Bell Canada. And I guess this past weekend, when it was snowy, my activity was working on these slides, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I guess it's almost relevant in the sense that when it was snowing this past weekend, I was working on slides. If I think about all the times that it's snowing, I'm usually either watching a show or playing video games or something else. So the information that it's snowing was not enough to say I would necessarily be working on slides. And that's more or less the thought behind the field of causal inference. If you look at classical statistics and classical inference, you look at the conditional probability, the times that you see some outcome given some input. But in, class, in causal sorry, inference, you're trying to go a step further and say if you change the circumstances, so if I can make it snow, what would that outcome be? If I can make it snow tomorrow, would I still be working on slides? Or would I be doing something else? And the paper that I'm presenting today, um, the key contribution, I think, was applying neural networks and building a generative model that will allow you to simulate interventions on one or more variables in a system and evaluate their impact on a set of target variables. What I'll talk about is first an intro to causal inference to motivate just the problem more generally, then go into the algorithm proposed within the paper. Uh, we'll break for a couple minutes and then get into the experiments that they ran to validate the algorithm, as well going into the key takeaways and the discussion portion. So why causal inference? Judea Pearl, more or less known as the father of causal inference, talks about the gold standard for making causal claims today being a randomized controlled trial. However, in many situations, it's either prohibitively expensive or maybe even unethical. For example, if you were to deny someone a treatment for surgery just to see whether or not that surgery was effective in curing their disease. And so in situations where control trials are not available. Drawing inferences on causal dependencies from observational data is a way to get around and, and learn more from your data than you could otherwise. And so I hope in this talk to motivate causal inference, especially applying neural networks to the problem as a good way of learning about relationships that you otherwise might not. And I'll start with some definitions. So first of all, we have a vector x, which is our observed variables in the system. You could think, for example, if x1 were the, num the price of cigarettes, x2 was the number of cigarettes smoked on average by someone in a city in Toronto. And together, these variables that you've observed form a joint distribution P of x. On the left side of the screen, you'll see a graph, graph being the circles with the x's in them, uh, vertices, and the lines between different vertices' edges. This graph doesn't have any arrows. Um, the edges don't have arrows, meaning that they are undirected. And so, a graph looking like this would be considered a skeleton. Any path in the graph means that there's some relationship of dependence, <coughs> potentially between variables xi and xj. And the absence of an edge between vertices means that there, we're assuming there is no causal relationship between those two variables. So now, what is a functional causal model? You can think of it as just a very quick clarification question. So 
um, when there is just there is, there are no arrows. So do you infer causal relationship or just a, a relationship with a correlation? There is a correlation. There is a relationship of dependence if you look at the underlying distribution, but it might or might not be causal. And a functional causal model is has three components. First, you have your graph G, um, which would be a directed version of the skeleton you saw earlier. Directed meaning that the arrows indicate that, for example, x1 has some causal influence on variable x2. And yeah, you orient um, parents of a variable within the graph towards their parents being causes, towards their effects. <laughs> and you'll see that there are terms E in the graph in the graph zone. These account for noise, so just random variation in the variables that you're observing, as well as any variables that were not observed or recorded as part of the study. So in the case of And I guess that ties in with the causal sufficiency assumption. So the variables E represent either random variation or any influences that weren't included in the study. But one assumption that we make when we're analyzing um, uh, observations in causal inference is that anything that was not recorded as part of your observational sample only affects at most one variable in your observational sample. So any external variable can only affect one xi, not more than one. Um, otherwise, that's a confounder. And we're assuming anything that influences more than one variable is included in the variables that we've observed. And that's a standard assumption um, made when doing causal inference in any of the standard methods. And back to the goal. The goal is really to learn an interventional distribution. That is, if I were to take x1, for example, and fix it to some value, so if I were to have the ability as a policymaker to set the price of cigarettes, what would the outcomes or what would, the, what would change in the other variables that I'm interested in that the price of cigarettes has a causal influence on? For example, the number of lung cancer cells in the city of Toronto, or just the number of smokers. <coughs> Are there any questions? And so that's, those are some of the definitions um, of the terms that we'll be going through. But the problem of actually learning these models and learning the structure of these relationships, there are a couple of key sub-problems that you encounter. First of all, the bivariate cause-effect problem. So assume that we're in a universe where you have um, your price of cigarettes, number of cigarettes smoked per day, and number of lung cancer cells that are those quantities are produced by some <coughs> unknown generative process. And you also have these random noise variables that are distributed according to some normal distribution. And in this universe, the number of cigarettes that you smoke in a day is distinctly a function of half the price of cigarettes plus some random noise. Further, the number of lung cancer cells is the number of cigarettes you smoke per day plus some random noise. Just assume that this is reality. Question? Uh, my question is that EP, right? E subscript P. It's yes. the general it's the generative process for cigarettes smoked per day, right? Which yeah. is the generative process to generate B, right? So, yes. 
so then in this case, so your a is is a deterministic variable. So there's no noise in that equation, right? Because because E B is actually the process that, that generates B. Um. So as clarification, E B is not the process that generates B. B is generated as a function, in this case a linear function, of both A and some noise variable E B. Does that answer your question? So E B is not the gener generative process. It is just there's some variance coming from the generative process. Yeah. I guess for so, so the noise is coming from a generative process? The noise is coming from a generative process and variable A, B, and C are also coming from other unknown generative processes. So is it fair to, or, like, if these were Gaussian processes, it yeah. would be something like the average of the process uh, distribution, and E would be like this variance of that process sort of thing? Not exactly. Is it instantaneous noise? It's okay. instantaneous. So if you wanted to, or you can describe a sample mm -hmm. from distribution B as by drawing a sample from distribution A, um, multiplying by half, and then drawing a sample from distribution E of B and adding those two terms. anymore. How important is it that E B and E C are normally distributed? This is purely a toy example. So they could have any distribution? Yes. And in the algorithm later on you'll see that the distribution is sort of chosen at random. And so that's another one of the questions whether there's a more principled way of choosing that assumption. <coughs> oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and so you get a problem of identifiability. So I guess taking a step back, if you were to fit a regression, B is equal to a linear regression. Um, B is equal. You could uncover coefficients like B is 0.25a plus 0.5c, and it would do a decent job of predicting that relationship. But we, having this information about how this universe is structured, know that that is not the direction of the relationship. In actual fact, if you wanted to get an instance of uh, C, for example, you would need to generate B, and C is then determined by B. And one of the problems is in causal inference as a whole is that you have a joint distribution. You have a sample of data, um, so records, a thousand records of A, B, and C, but you need to decide how to point that arrow of causation between the variables. And that on its own is not a simple thing to do. Is it that B is caused by C, by some function of C? Or C is caused by some function of B? Another sub-problem within causal inference is identifying what's called a B structure. And it's represented in the graph on the side, where consider variables a students of, of a student's IQ being A, their score in some test being B, and the difficulty of the test being C. If you wanted to tell how smart a student was by their IQ, and all you knew was how difficult a test was without knowing their score, you probably don't get much more information. Because here I'm assuming that a student's IQ is independent of how hard a professor sets a test. That may not be a fair assumption, but that's the assumption here. 
But in the case where you know both what a student's, what, uh, how difficult the test was, as well as the score a student got on a test, you have more information than if you just knew um, the difficulty of the test. And so in terms of how that relationship would be structured in a causal graph, you get this V structure, but the algorithms aren't always able to recover that structure because of the conditional independence of A and C conditioned on B. Luckily, the CGNN algorithm is good at identifying G V structures. I'll talk a bit about that later as well. And more broadly, how do you actually learn these causal relationships between variables? There are different methods, one being constraint-based. So you look at, you test pairs of variables to start with on conditional independence, and then build a graph structure that way. There's score-based approaches, where you start with an empty graph and maybe add an edge, i causes j, evaluate it on some numerical function, like a likelihood function, how likely was I to see the data in my sample that I collected, given that the relationship is I causes J. Hybrid methods, which use a combination of conditional independence tests and score-based approaches. Or pairwise methods, which restrict the class of functions allowed. So for example, in Previous example where I fit a linear regression of B on A and C, that was assuming that there was a linear additive relationship between the cause and effect. And in some cases, restricting the class of functions is necessary for the same problem of identifiability. So consider where you want to tell whether it's A causes B or B causes A. If you have a very complex function that fits the relationship of A causes B, then, or if you have a very complex function, sometimes it might do too great a job, it might overfit on relationship in both directions. And so when you're trying to distinguish which direction has more predictive value, you aren't able to make that distinction. And so regularizing functions with respect to the local score empirically <coughs> has shown to help that problem. Can I ask a question about, can you give an example of the second item there? Of the second item. And the score same, based? I have the same question with the first item. <laughs> <laughs> so give examples for all. <laughs> Just for the first two, please. Like, could you like yeah. Okay. Um, well, for the score-based approach, <coughs> we have um, price of cigarettes, number of cigarettes smoked, and lung cancer cells. We'll assume at the start that we know nothing about the relationship with these, between these variables. And, and for the score-based approach, you would first look at price of cigarettes and your number of lung cancer cells. And you say, well, if price of cigarettes causes number of long lung cancer cells, then I'll fit some function f, uh, I don't know, a regression. And I will input my price of cigarettes and generate samples of what the number of lung cancer cells should be, given that the causal relationship is in that direction. Then I'll compare that distribution to the actual observational distribution, I compute a likelihood score. Sure. And so depending on the score, the direction that has a better score, um, I will keep that orientation of the causal relationship. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And then for the constraint-based methods, I'll be honest, the paper gave constraint-based as an alternative approach, but it didn't elaborate on it, so I don't have the greatest example. Um, but it does have many references. 
um, different papers that go more into detail on that. Uh, so, do you? Uh, so, uh, just based on definition, we know that uh, like if you have A, B, C, and uh, then uh, we know like uh, A to C, we know B, A, and C become like independent. So it's just testing this hypothesis with some hypothesis test and see if there are just conditional independence or not. So it goes through all these uh, combinations and tests these uh, independence, conditional independence. What kind of testing is it? Like, is it like significance testing? Or? Uh, so, like, we know that uh, like independence test uh, A and uh, uh, like P of X and Y is equal to PX times P. So it, it just tests uh, with those like resampling and calculating those kind of tests. Yeah. But isn't that combinatorial number of tests? Like it's not practical, right? Yeah. It's not Did everyone hear the answer to the question? Yes. Just one thing, uh, if uh, um, in your example with uh, the price of cigarettes correlating uh, with the number of uh, lung cancer cells, yep. if the correlation is very, very high, you can you, you can infer a correlation in the other direction, right? Correct. Okay. And so the goal of the pairwise methods, or I guess the idea, is that there should be asymmetry in the distribution. Predicting one way should have um, a more regular error than predicting the other way. But if you have too complex a function, fitting that relationship, it will fit the variance of the error, and you won't be able to distinguish the direction. So you try to regularize the function, um, fit a function as simple as can predict well, that can help you sample from, generate samples that match your actual observed distribution without, while still being able to tell um, A causes B performs better than B causes A. Does that answer your question? And in many cases, we, we cannot find what the direction, and we just leave it as So now I'll talk about the algorithm proposed in the paper. So CGNN is a functional causal model. Similarly, you have your graph, your set of functions f that define the relationship between causes and effects, and a distribution epsilon of your error terms. The contribution of this paper is using one hidden layer regression neural networks as your causal mechanisms f of i. And each um, network within the algorithm uses the same number of hidden neurons, n of h, because of the uh, regularization constraint um, and trying to be able to recover which direction of causation is actually valid. Um, the paper also uses ReLU activation units and your error terms, E of i, are independent of your observed variable xi and they're distributed iid by the same distribution. In the paper, they use either the uniform 0-1 distribution or a standard normal. Can you explain the graph? Like what's happening? Okay. So it's a generative model. So say you wanted to sample from your distribution x. And we've assumed that we've already fit our causal mechanisms f. First, you would sample from your normal distribution. Sorry, before you go on. So what do you mean by causal mechanism? Did you define that before? Uh, yeah, sorry. So your f hat here defines a family of functions. Each f hat, um, one, two, three, uh, one through d, relates causes of variable i 
two variable i, to be fact variable i. So, for example, if x1 has one cause, just random variation, and if you sample from the error distribution and pass that variable into the functional causal mechanism, then you have an estimate for what a x1 variable would look like. So, like in your examples before, you were talking about linear com linear relationships between your variables, like noise and other variables. Yes. But here you were saying there, there's f, which is a more general function that relates e, which is noise, and x, which is, for example, x2 is some function of noise e2 and variable x1. And essentially, then you build a graph out of all of this. How do you determine? Oh, I think we might have the same question. <laughs> and if I'm getting ahead of me, just tell me, ahead of this, just tell me to wait. Sure. Um, you spent a whole bunch of the first section talking about um, some difficulty in discovering what the relationships between variables are. Here, I'm seeing that the neural networks, as you know, function approximators, they've been already placed in. Uh, places of relationships in this graph, those directed relationships already exist. Right. Is it a contribution of the paper that talks about also how you would discover where those relationships would be? Or Yes and no. Okay. So the input to the algorithm in the paper is a skeleton, um, which is the undirected graph. And the assumption here is you'd either use domain expertise, prior knowledge, to say, I think these variables may have a relationship. These ones are unrelated. There are also methods, like the score-based methods or other methods proposed to learn a graph just given your joint distribution. Um, but they're outside of scope and pretty expensive to actually run. So Awesome. Answers my question. Thank you. Sweet. I think in the paper, if I may, in this paper they use a feature-based method uh, right. to create a skeleton, which is just try different. You pick one, try other ones to see if you can predict this one and which one are important, and then refine it later. There's also, are you familiar with Lasso? Yeah, so there was a nonlinear version of Lasso first run on the full data set, and then from that subset of features, you would start to say, well, maybe there are relationships between that subset. Can you clarify what a skeleton is? Okay. Um, a skeleton or <coughs> is no. this one. An undirected graph that shows dependence between variables. You see a skeleton is an input of a... It's an input to the causal generative neural network, CGNN algorithm. Uh, so have you previously found out that there, are, there is dependency between these two variables, like correlation or whatever? Or uh, is this randomly in choice? It, you previously do some investigation, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the hope of the neural nets is to uh, determine sort of the, the direction of like the of the graph or the, so of the of the dependency. Determine the direction, as well as allow you to sample to generate samples um, based on that causal structure. Uh -huh. Nice. Are there so your eventual goal there is to learn all the f functions. Yes. And if you know the f functions, then you can generate your random vector of e's and see what, or say you fix an x1 to a particular value, then see what, how that propagates through the network of relationships between other variables. And, and like how many f's you would need depends on the graph that you're trying. Like you might be trying different graphs saying they're score-based, and then eventually you choose whichever graph gives you the best score sort of thing? Yes. Another question? Yep. So you start with the skeleton as an input, and 
you go through the process and you develop the functions and the cost of relationships. So would part of that be eliminating some of those undirected edges or uh, just simply putting arrows on them? In the algorithm as proposed, you're simply placing arrows. But at the end, you can also compute a confidence score of sorts. So how well does this graph generate data similar to the data that I observe with the edge in the graph or without it? The lower the score, the higher, because the, the higher the score, um, the more deviation your generated data has from what you've actually observed. And so you have less faith in that relationship. And it didn't, the paper didn't explicitly say it, but I I think the way that they calculate some of the evaluation metrics is by placing a cutoff on the confidence that you allow in your final edges. Can we think of there being any error in the skeleton generation process? Uh, can we look good or bad skeletons, or is that just considered ground truth? Uh, there definitely can be errors in the skeleton generation process. And, well, in the experimental validation, they're, they did do some tests on how robust it was to feeding in a skeleton with some error. But yeah, it, it is the starting point, and so you are somewhat biased and at the mercy of how good that initial skeleton is. Awesome. I have a good question. Uh, so there's a statement here that all error terms are independent of XI and IID. Yes. Uh, can we make a st statement about the distribution of the XIs? That they're similar, that they have the same distribution of as the error terms. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Because the xi's are a function. The xi's are a function of their parent xi's and ei. So whatever happens within the neural net could change that distribution. Yeah. So for ei, you said uh, you can choose like uniform distribution or standard normal. Are, what are the implications of choosing any arbitrary distribution? That is a good question that was not addressed in the paper, and it's a question I also have. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. Could be a nice discussion. Yeah. yeah. Are there any more questions? Okay. And so the loss function. The loss function is essentially comparing the distribution of the data generated by the CGNN to distribution of the input observational data. And it's different from, say, a cross-entropy loss in a classification neural network, where you're comparing how your predicted probabilities differ from your label. Instead, in order to evaluate how well the network you fit is doing, you have to sample from the generative distribution and then compare it to your input distribution. And you do that comparison using a metric called the maximum mean discrepancy. Essentially, you define some kernel. They use the Gaussian kernel since it's differentiable, allowing you to use backprop to train the full network. And you're embedding the mean of your observational distribution in the kernel space as well as the mean of your generated distribution and seeing how much distance there is. So as you are optimizing your model, you want that number to go down. That means that it's probably doing a good job of generating the actual distribution. Well, what's the variance? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you can observe high variance in the observed data, and the neural network can just not collapse or have this model. Fair point. As proposed, they were only considering a first moment. That could be another consideration. Another one of the problems, even with just um, comparing on the expectation, is this um, the base MMD was like order n squared to evaluate. So it was already pretty expensive. And comparing higher moments would compound that factor. Potentially, I think as a direction, as a future direction for research into 
choosing loss functions or making the algorithm better, um, exploring methods of comparing multiple moments or higher order moments uh, is a good direction, but it was not addressed in this current paper. Are there any questions? And there's also a regularization term uh, placed on the number of edges. And as the author put it, to make the comparison between bigger and smaller graphs uh, more fair. <coughs> and now I'll talk about the actual algorithm used to learn this structure. First of all, you start, um, well, there's a typo, ignore the for and entry and iterations, but you start with an input of your skeleton causal graph and your regularized objective function, and you go edge by edge. So say x1, x2, and you fit two neural networks, one with x1 causing x2, or I should say x1 plus some EI causing x2, and you train the opposite direction as well. The one with the smaller local score is then the orientation that you will keep. And you continue doing that for each edge in your skeleton. Just a quick clarification question. The schematic of the model that you showed us maybe three slides back? Yes. That's the end state of the model? Yes. That's not where you're starting? No. And it's at this stage, this first stage, where you start to fit um, a function f in between each edge picture. Doesn't that mean you have to fit f both directions? Yes. It's a very expensive process. That's one of the drawbacks of this. <laughs> and also an area of research that the authors um, have on their radar going forward. So, no, no, please go on. You may answer my question. And so, depending on how you orient the edges, you could create cycles. So the second step in this is a more or less naive traversal of the graph. Anytime you come across a cycle, you reverse the edge until you get back a DAG. Again, there could be better, more efficient ways of going about the process, but this is the algorithm as proposed. And then, for some finite number of iterations, you do a global optimization. So you pick an edge, reverse it, and retrain according to the global score. So the maximum mean discrepancy between the full observational distribution and the full generated distribution, whereas before we were just doing the two variable distributions. If the score globally is better than the graph that you had, then you adopt the new graph and continue until hopefully reaching a local optimum. And at the end of the process, you have those confident scores in each of the edges that you fit. And it's a measure of how well the model um, generates with the edge in versus if you had removed it. Are there any questions? Clarification of what's a sorry a directed acyclic graph is a graph um, so vertices and edges where each edge has a direction um, so a points towards b but there are no cycles there is no three um, vertices that form a circle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, are there any more questions? So, um, do you mind saying that I, I may have missed it? But step one, uh, when you start, there is a direction or there is not a direction? When you, you randomly set the direction and then you refine, is that what's going on? So, at the start, the input is just a skeleton. Sorry, F. And the skeleton is completely undirected. There are cases where you could feed a partially oriented graph, a completed partially 
directed acyclic graph, CP DAG, but um, I guess for this talk, I just didn't talk about that case. So, wait, so the reason I'm asking is that, so you say producing new G, and also you're saying tra traversing the graph and remove cycles by reversing your edges. So like the, the ha it has to be edges to be reversed. So it's the after step one, every edge has an orientation. Yeah, every edge has a direction. And so by step two, you're removing any cycles. What is D, the last one? Sorry. D there is. Uh, no, D is data. D is the underlying observational distribution. So that's where you would compare if you generate from um, your fit model the distribution of that compared to the distribution of the observation data that you train on. Are there any more? Yes, I want to ask you, uh, how do you know your target data distribution? Do you have to approximate it by some other distribution? How do you, how do you model that? You're trying to measure discrepancy between two distributions, right? Right. So when I understand you're getting the neural network with your error, right? You can, you can sample from that, but from the actual data, how do you know the distribution of actual data? The measure of the distribution is embedding the mean in the kernel space. And I guess I have a slide at the end where I can show you the actual um, function or the functional form. No? Let's get to that. So you'll answer the question when we get there. Uh, well, appendix, but. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you show it briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so the first term is looking at how the observational distribution, or so if you take the kernel function, applying a kernel function to samples in your data set as a measure of similarity, of those samples in your data set, then first term is how similar your observational sample is and the average similarity dividing by the n squared. Second term is how similar the mean is in your generated distribution. Third term is a measure of the similarity of your observational with your mean. And because you're subtracting those terms, you want them to be similar. So it approaches zero. And there's a proposition presented in the paper that shows well, as your data increases, you that, and as you minimize the MMD function, you get closer and closer to approximating the true distribution, at least borne out in that sample that you've collected. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, so you're using Cardinal function here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry if I brushed over that earlier. Are there. I have one quick clarification. So the skeleton can have cycles in that. The skeleton cannot have cycles. So what did you mean by removing cycles in the second step? In the second step, you are or in the first step, you are orienting edge um, edges just pair by pair. So I see your question. I see your question. Um, I guess, yeah, there, there is no constraint on the skeleton. The skeleton is an undirected set of relationship dependencies. But there never was a constraint. And if I put it there, then I may have been incorrect. But I guess there could have been cycles in the skeleton. But once you get to step two, if the, there were cycles introduced when you started to orient the edges, then you're removing them. I see. So I have one quick follow-up question. If that is the case, is there an intelligent way of choosing a pair of variables so that you don't have to do this, like don't have to traverse, change the directions and traverse them again. Yeah. Um, 
that is a question that I pose well. I don't have an answer, but it does seem as though there should be ideas from graph theory on just how graphs are structured, on traversing paths that give you a more intelligent search and cycle removal algorithm than randomly traversing graphs. Hi everybody, welcome to TDLS. I'm Lindsay, I'm one of the members of the steering committee. If you liked the video you just saw, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll be the first to find out about every video we put out.